Hey guys, what's up? The Airsoft Tech here. So I get an absolute ton of questions about things like, how do you get such perfect shimming? How do you shim? How do I shim a gearbox? Please tell me how to shim a gearbox. So today we're going to be answering that long-awaited question with this video, a guide on how to perfectly shim a gearbox. Before we go any further, we have to actually define some terms here. The first one being shimming. Shimming, in reference to airsoft gearboxes, is the action of creating a system that is maximally mechanically efficient. Proper shimming is achieved by adjusting the height and tightness of the gears in the drivetrain, so that each gear can take advantage of things that allow the gear to be efficient, all while eliminating things that prevent the gears from transferring energy efficiently. In short, we want to find the pathway of least resistance for a given gear set in a given gearbox. Shimming contrary to popular belief, is not difficult at all. But someone who fully understands shimming is someone who is a mechanical critical thinker. And that is an important thing that all techs that accept pay for their work should be able to understand, explain, and apply to everything about mechanics. The difference between good shimming and poor shimming is broken gears and locked up gearboxes. So as you can see here, this is a JG Spur and a GMP bevel gear. The JG Spur has been broken right here, and this is due to poor shimming of it being too low in the gearbox shell, which meant that it you know, knocked up against the uh, bushing in the lower portion of the gearbox shell, thereby breaking one of the, tooth, or one of the teeth on the spur. And this GMP bevel gear here broke because it was way, way too high in the gearbox shell. And so these teeth eventually just bowed out and snapped because they didn't have enough contact between the spur. Like I said, before we go any further, we have to actually define some parts and terms here so that later on in the video when I use these terms and, you know, the names of these parts, you don't get confused about what part I'm referring to. You can just know and fast forward or rewind back in the video to see what part I'm talking about. But anyway, we're going to start defining the gears and, and uh, giving you each their names so that we can go from there and so that we don't get confused later on. Anyway, so the first gear in our drivetrain is the pinion gear. This one's pretty simple. The pinion gear is a pinion gear because... It, it, is, it is a pinion on the top of a tower, and so that's why it is named that. It's the first gear in your drivetrain. People will sometimes say the bevel gear is your first one. That's not true. The first one is the pinion gear on the motor. Some are O-type, some are D-type. This one's O-type. So the next gear in your drivetrain is the bevel gear. It's called the bevel gear because, well, it has a bevel to it, and a bevel means an angle, so that is what this is called. Next gear in our drivetrain is our spur gear. And the reason it's called a spur gear is sort of, uh, there's some controversy over what it should be technically called. I'm not absolutely sure what is the absolute technical term for it. Some people call it the step gear, some people call it the spur gear. It's called the spur gear because it's circular and it has no other identifying characteristics. Some people call it a step gear because it's between the bevel and the sector gear. I use them inter inter interchangeably, whether that's wrong from a mechanical perspective, I don't know. Some mechanical engineer might correct me below. The next gear in our drivetrain is the sector gear. The reason why it's called the sector gear is because it has, well, first of all, it has a full circular set of teeth in the bottom half, and the top half it has a sector of teeth. This one is a dual sector gear. It is, you know, as you can see, it has two sectors of teeth. This is nine on each side. A standard sector gear has a full set of teeth all on the same side or all on a continuous line. This one has 16 teeth, and the other one has nine on each side. So that is why it's called a sector gear. The next things we should probably just go ahead and define and get out of the way are the bushings. The bushings are circular pieces of metal, usually steel. Some of them are copper and brass, but immediately, immediately replace those if you have those. But these are, in particular, steel by VFC. And the reason why they're called bushings is because they sit around and they are sort of a, uh, a surface for the gears to rotate around. The axles will fit into these bushing holes, and that's what the gear will rotate on. And so that if anything is going to wear out on this setup, it's going to be the bushings and not the shell. Bushings are much cheaper and easier to replace than a gearbox shell is. Sometimes you have bearings as well, which we all know what bearings are. They have little steel bearings inside of these little races, and so they're like on a track, and so that when the gear rotates, the bushing rotates with it and tries to take some resistance off of, you know, it, it tries to take away resistance from here in these points right here. So the next thing, and probably the final thing that we're going to be defining, are the shims. Shims are basically washers or thin discs of metal that you will put on your gear axles to adjust their height, their tightness, you know, and all this stuff, etc., in the gearbox. So they come in varying shapes and sizes. I prefer SHS 
shims just simply because they're much more precise, they're, they're thinner and all this stuff, and you can distinguish between them much more easily. And the reason why you can distinguish between them is this one is an octagon, and it is a 0.1 millimeter of thickness. Uh, it has a 0.1 millimeter of thickness to it. This one is copper, and it's also circular, and it has 0.15 millimeters of thickness to it. And then this one is silver, circular, and has 0.2 millimeters of thickness. I can easily distinguish between all these. Sometimes if you have a really, really good uh, ability to judge differences, you can pick these shims up, and you can kind of wiggle your fingers around in it and feel the difference between uh, you know, two sets but that's sometimes harder to do, you're not always right, so I prefer shims that I can easily distinguish the difference between, and that is clearly shims, that difference in shape and color. Now that we've defined all of our terms, let's get down to exactly what you're going to need to shim a gearbox shell. So what you're going to need is all your parts, obviously, the upper and lower portions of your gearbox shell, the motor, all your gears, you're going to need the motor grip that's not pictured, you're going to need your lower receiver, which is also not pictured. I'll tell you why in, all, in a minute. But basically keep everything that you've disassembled from your gun on standby because you just might need it later on in this video. Another thing you're going to need is you know good sets of screwdrivers, uh, the, the appropriate one to you know screw and unscrew your gearbox shell down. I always would I always love to have one of these screwdrivers with me because I can test the height of the gears and how they sit with this because I can poke it through the bushing axle holes. You're obviously going to need your shims and you just might need some super glue for your bushings but we will get onto that later on in the video. Before we get into actually shimming in the gearbox and our gears, we're going to go over some rules of shimming. You should follow these rules as you go throughout your entire shimming process. First rule of shimming, always screw your gearbox shell together when you test the play with your gears. Never just hold it with your hands, never clamp it in a vise, actually screw it together. I only put one, two, three, or four screws in the gearbox shell in the corners, so like one would be right here, one down here, one up here, and one right here. So that they surround the gears, and so the screws hold the gearbox shell together and emulate how the gearbox shell will, would normally cycle. So if your gearbox shell is normally together with screws, then you should test your gear play at that point where it's most normal with it closed down and with, all the, with four or so the screws together. Second rule of shimming is to completely eliminate as many variables as possible. And what I mean by this is that when you shim, you shouldn't make shimming a guessing game. You shouldn't make things like this a guessing game. Because if it's a guessing game, then you can't, you don't know how your work's going to turn out when you put the gear, when you put the gearbox together, put the gun, put the gun together, and go out to test it. Because you took a guess on almost everything. Some people who have been doing this for years, like me, can guess on some things. But we shouldn't guess all the time because then what are we basing anything off of? So we try to eliminate as many variables as possible, and the version 2 gearbox shell is the excellent example of this because there are a lot of variables that exist in a version 2 gearbox shell, when it comes down to shimming at least. So we're going, I'm going to be showing you how to get rid of some of these variables and to leave as few variables as possible so that you can deal with those variables and so that you can, e so that you can easily deal with these few variables as opposed to dealing with a multitude of variables that you don't know if they affect each other in different ways. The third rule of shimming is pretty obvious take your time. If you're a beginner, shimming is probably going to take you about two hours. If you're an expert, it's probably going to take you about 15 minutes. So one of the very first variables we're going to totally eliminate from our equation is the variable between the receiver, the grip, and the gearbox shell. So for those of you who have had your fair bit of experience with version 2 gearbox shells, you can know how frustrating it is to put a you know, low next gearbox shell into a GMP receiver and it just not fit right. And the reason why it doesn't fit right is because gearbox shells are made with different specifications. And that's just the unfortunate reality of what Airsoft is. All these different parts fit different parts differently. And so we have this issue where we have specification issues where sometimes we'll put a gearbox shell in, we'll screw it all down, and we can visibly see that it is 10 degrees facing upward. And that obviously isn't good because we're going to get an FPS decrease, we're going to get accuracy, feeding, we're going to get shimming issues, and everything like this. So we want to eliminate as many variables as we possibly can. And the first one to eliminate is between, when it comes down to shimming, is between the grip, motor, and the receiver and gearbox shell. So for example, if we put this grip in and we put the whole gun back together and we see that this receiver dips back about 10 degrees, we can attribute that possibly to the grip. And one of the things I do when I shim all my guns is I shim and I actually take a file or a sand belt table and I it, like remove some of the grip space here so that when I screw the whole entire setup down there is a space between the receiver 
and the grip in all directions, meaning that the receiver cannot throw off the motor angle due to the way the grip is installed. So as you can see, this is a slightly poor example of how you should do this, but you want there to be a space between the receiver and the grip in every single angle. But this is essentially what you want to do because this isn't thrown off anymore. So if you weren't, if you if you didn't do this and your grip really sat like this, then your motor is going to sit like that as well, and it's not going to mesh properly with the bevel gear. However, if you do all this shaving and removing and fixing of all your variables, then you'll get this case right here because naturally in the gearbox shell the bevel gear sits like this. But if your motor dictates otherwise, it could sit like this. And you don't want that because it's going to create a system in which the bevel gear wears down, the pinion gear wears down, using more energy to accomplish a similar task. So the very first thing I do is always check the spacing here. Now, is it always needed? No, not always. Sometimes you get guns like JG, Echo One, ANK, VFC, the list goes on, of guns that have this really perfect meshing right here to where the, the, the grip fits perfectly up against the receiver and doesn't change the shimming aspect at all. But for a lot of builds, that use a ZCI grip, a GMP receiver, and a Lonex gearbox shell, you oftentimes have to do this because your, your motor grip angle is going to be affected, and this is the best way of fixing this. You can also use shims to space it back, but I don't like doing that because it adds distance to my grip and it kind of feels weird sometimes. But this is what I do. I always take a, a, a Dremel, a, a piece of sandpaper, file, sand belt table, whatever have you, and I always remove enough so that the grip is not touching the receiver. The next thing we need to do is actually get down to shimming a gear in the gearbox shell. So the first gear we're going to be shimming is the bevel and the pinion gear. I would argue that this point of shimming is the hardest for people to understand because it's usually where people spend the most time and it's usually where the most noise and the most uh, inefficiency occurs in a gearbox shell. Because it's this angle and the angles between a grip and then the gearbox shell, there's a lot of variables involved and that's what trips people up. So like I said, we have to eliminate as many variables as possible, which is what we did with the grip and the receiver. So now what we do is we shim the motor to the bevel. So what we're going to want to do is set up this apparatus here. And this apparatus is known as the half shell method. You may actually be familiar with it, you may have heard it before. We're not going to stop here, but this is a good method to setting our motor height. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And that is all we're going to do with this particular apparatus, and then we're going to move on. But the type of height you want is very specific, and there's, it's very easy to tell what that height is. And I'll show you right now. Once you set up the half shell method, you should get into a position where you can view something similar on your side. Basically what you want is you want the motor to be high enough to where it is making full contact with the bevel and nothing more. And nothing less. And so this would be a better view, but this is how it's going to look in your apparatus, but this is how it's going to look if you could actually fit inside the gearbox shell. You want something that takes full advantage and full contact of the bevel gear, but at the same time isn't too low or isn't higher. This sweet spot right here, which doesn't really have a term, but I guess you could just say it's called proper motor height, allows the motor to take full advantage of the leverage that the bevel gear could, uh, could give it. So imagine holding a baseball bat. When you hold it very, very low to the handle, and you, you know, you're not choking up on the bat, you can hit a baseball and you can easily hit a home run because you have more leverage. But if you hold your hands very high up on the bat, you know, a third to halfway up, you're not hitting it. You're, going, you're not going to hit the baseball very far at all because it's going to take more energy to get that kind of result. And you can only expend so much energy as a human being per baseball swing. That is. So this is the same concept here. When it is lower, it has much more leverage. After we have set up proper motor height, what we want to do is adjust the bevel gear to match it. So the motor only goes up or down. So we want to adjust the drivetrain to match it. And so what we do from here is we set up this apparatus and we look at and observe the amount of space, you know, uh, empty free space here between the bevel and the pinion by knocking the bevel back and forth. And I'll get you guys a close view of this. So here is a close view as I can get. Here is the amount of movement we currently have. This is when the bevel gear has absolutely no shims on either side and the, and the motor is adjusted as we did in the previous uh, section of this video.
So that is the movement there. And we want to remove as much of that as possible while still having as little movement as possible. And I will show you what that looks like by adding some shims to the flat surface of the bevel, the top portion, or this portion right here. We're only adding it to the top portion at this point. I'll show you what that looks like. All right, so maintaining this apparatus, I have taken the gearbox shell apart, put shims, you know, progressively put shims on the top portion of the bevel gear, screwed the gearbox shell shut, attached the motor grip, inserted the motor, screwed down the motor plate, and now I can test the shimming on the bevel gear. And that is exactly what we want. We want as little movement as possible. So uh, a good a good test is a, a good test to know when you get it right is if you take more shims after this point and you put more shims on it and it becomes way too tight you know that this current state is your best state so what I like to do is I like to test the side to side movement which we have we can hear clicking when I push it back or forward which means it's knocking into the pinion like it should meaning that there is space between the pinion teeth and the bevel teeth which is yet again what we want. And then I test the bevel's vertical play, which I'll show you in a better shot here. The vertical play is quite simple. All I do is I take a screw, or a screwdriver, and I push up on the bevel gear, on the axle. And if I can see the bevel gear move up and down ever so slightly, which I can see easily in my eyes, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there it is. And that's exactly what we're looking for. And then if I add more shims, it becomes too tight. But if I take away shims, it becomes too loose. So there's that middle ground right there. And we know that this is the perfect motor pinion to bevel contact because we've taken away the grip variable, we've screwed down the gearbox shell taking away that variable, and we've left it all down to simply the gear and the pinion. And if you don't have this hole here, you can go through the top here, which is much harder, or you can just dremel your own hole here. Um, I know a lot of JG, A and K, D boys, gearbox shells don't come with this little hole here, but you should honestly put one here. If you don't, it's going to be a lot harder for you. Not impossible, but a lot harder for you. So you should really put this hole here. So after we have set the bevel to motor shimming and the bevel gear shimming according to the motor, we want to remove the little bit of play that we have left between the bevel and the gearbox shell. So let's stick shims on the bottom portion of the bevel gear or this portion of the bevel gear to tighten it up as tight as we can get while still maintaining maximum rotation on the bevel gear. So let's do that real quick and I'll show you what the result looks like. All right, so now I have the entire gearbox shell screwed down, making sure that I'm applying that rule of shimming. And now I can test the vertical play on the bevel gear after I have shimmed out on the bottom. And we have incredibly minimal play, which is what we want. And the gear rotates pretty fine. Now let's shim the spur gear, which is, I would say, is one of the easiest gears to shim. So as you can tell, we have the spur gear inside the gearbox shell and nothing else at all. We even took out our bevel gear. So the next thing we're going to want to do is test the spur gear. So we have the spur gear in. There's no shims in the bottom of the spur gear. There's no shims in its bushing. And keep in mind, this is a 10 to 1 spur, so we're not going to get the same effect here. And I'll, I'll put in a, another spur gear to, to demonstrate it. But thanks for looking for the spur gear. Very simple. We don't want the spur gear to be touching this bushing at all. Physically touching. It can be overlapping, but if it's touching, that is very bad, and it'll destroy teeth very very quickly so we don't want that to happen second of all we don't want it to be rubbing too much on this so for example if the bushing is risen up above the shell that's fine we don't need to put a shim there just for that reason it can rotate just fine but if your bushing is lower than the shell which happens in some cases then you don't want to stick this gear in here with no shims because it'll destroy the gearbox shell especially a much much harder gear than you know the shell this this is a siege type gear and if it really wanted to it could tear through any portion of this gearbox shell so I want to avoid that, clearly. So that's what we're going to test. I'm going to show you how to avoid the spur to bevel or spur to bushing contact and the gearbox contact as well. So I have a standard JG, what looks to be a JG, uh, spur gear here, and it's rotating inside the gearbox shell, no shims underneath of it, just like the previous one. And it is not touching this bushing here. As you can see, it 
it does overlap it, and that's not an issue. What the issue could be is it actually touching it and, sc and scraping up against it. Rule of thumb is that most of the time bushings are significantly harder than the gear body itself, so that if this is rotating, you're going to absolutely destroy the Springer's lower teeth if it's touching this. If it's not, you're good to go, and there's no adjustments needed here. But if it is, you need to fix that immediately because it'll destroy the gear, and we don't want that. And the next thing here is that it's very easy to tell that the bushing here is much higher than the gearbox shell because if we put a screwdriver on the gear on the bushing and pull down towards the gear, gearbox shell, you'll hear and you can feel that the bushing is higher than the gearbox shell, which we're good to go there. So that leaves us to check one final thing before we finally shim our spur gear. So the last thing we want to check with the spur gear before we actually get to shimming the spur gear is the space between the spur gear body, right here, and the bevel gear. What we don't want to occur is we don't want the spur to be so high that it's pushing into the bevel gear's body. We want it to be low enough to where it's making about 70% tooth contact at the lowest, I'd say. You can go lower, but I think 70% is a good number. Below 50 and you're definitely going to risk stripping something, but 70% you know, 50 to 70% is a good contact level. If you can get more, get more, and that's great. But if you can't, don't worry about it. But what you want to make sure at the very least here is that the body right here on the bevel gear that isn't teeth is not touching the spur. You want to make sure that that is not occurring. And that here is not occurring. We actually have quite a bit of space between the bevel and the spur. So what we're going to do is bring the spur up 0.1 millimeters of shim upward and this will allow us to make a little bit more contact with those bevel teeth and we'll go from there. So this apparatus from the camera's perspective may be a little bit awkward at first but you gotta realize what we're working with here. This is the front of the gearbox shell so this is where your air nozzle comes out of. This is where your trigger contacts are right in here. You want to find this hole after you put the spur gear and after you put you know a little bit of shim on there to raise it up to meet the bevel gear teeth a little bit better. Close the gearbox shell up and find this hole right here. This hole you will look into and you will see the contact point between the bevel and the spur. And if your spur is making contact with the bevel gear's body, you know, where the anti-reversal latches are, then you, then, then you know that your spur gear is already too high. If it's too high, lower it down a bit, but make sure you're not hitting the bushing again, like I said. If you can't find a sweet spot at all, as in your spur, no matter how you have it, it's either knocking a bushing or or it's you know hitting the anti-reversal latch, then you might have to go back and change a couple things. Sometimes you can sand some bushings down to give you some more space. Sometimes you do at the you know sometimes it's a last resort, but you do have to change the motor height a little bit. But that would be a rare case scenario. It's it's very rare. But you know, like I said, you can shave bushings down if you need to. Uh, you can adjust the bevel gear a little bit here and there, but don't go too far off of your motor height setting. Now that we have the proper setting between the spur and the bevel, what we want to do is shim all that looseness out of the spur to where it is stable just like the bevel gear. So let's do that real quick and I'll show you the end result of that. So like I said, we shimmed the spur gear. It's tight now that it's not going to go anywhere and that it's having this very minimal movement, but maximum, or very minimal vertical movement, but maximum rotational movement. So we can test that and we can see that it's gonna be very hard to tell on this one. If the spur barely moves up and down, and when I rotate it, that's my ring hitting it, so there we go. You can you can't hear any scraping any this you, if if it's hitting the if it's hitting the bushing you can hear like a knocking like it's kind of like you know it's kind of like a knocking at a door but you know very very uh, it's it's very distinct but at the same time like you will know that it's coming from there so there's no scraping on the gearbox show there's no scraping or knocking on the be on the bevel's lower bushing so that is totally good to go we are perfectly fine to go from here on. I took out the bevel gear just because I wanted to listen to just this rotation here, which it sounds perfect. Um, from here we will uh, shim the sector gear and I will show you what that sounds like and how to shim it between these two gears here, the spur and the sector gear next. The next gear we're shimming is the sector gear. And like I said, this is a dual sector gear, but it shouldn't affect how we do the shimming. There's no reason why a dual sector gear should affect it, sh should affect our shimming. So it, it's fine and good to go. Don't worry about that. If you're using a single stroke sector gear, you're good to go too. Just follow this guide and you will end up in the right place. I promise you. So the next thing we want to look at is the contact point between the spur gear and the sector gear. This one is important, um, but it's not hard at all. All the shimming is important, but this part I 
I take a lot of time on because you can easily see how to get it right and you can easily get it right if you have proper shims. So we want to make sure that this portion right here is not touching the surface on here. We want just gear teeth touching and that is all, but we want the maximum amount of gear teeth touch or gear teeth interface as possible. So let's just keep in mind we don't want the surfaces to touch but just the teeth to touch, but a maximum number of those teeth to touch or a maximum percentage of the teeth surface to touch. So that means that this center gear must be risen up just enough so it's not touching the surface right here, but not too much to where it's not missing a bunch or a large percentage of the teeth surface. So the best way to do this is to put this gearbox shell on like this. You don't have to screw it down for this portion because you're just viewing an angle. And so you look down in, in this angle right here, and I, it's going to be very difficult to show on the camera. I do not think I'm going to be able to do it. But you look down this hole right here where the motor uh, fits in normally, and you view the contact point between the sector gear and the spur gear. And if it's a ton, like you see an absolute ton of space, then what you want to do is bring those closer together. If you see that they're just rubbing up against each other and that you can't see any light between them at all, then you want to bring it up just a little bit. My rule of thumb is, is that if I can see light between them and I, if, I, if I can't push the sector gear down or push the spur gear up to touching it, then it's 100% good to go. So I will shim that up and I will do my best to show you how or give you an audio that you can hear and listen to that will have the proper shimming effect. So now I have my sector gear shimmed and my spur gear shimmed. I'm going to show you guys how it sounds when you rotate two of these gears together. But here's how my setup with the current shimming on it sounds. As you can tell it's very quiet. But a good test to see how good your shimming is is to rotate your shell upside down and see if the shimming change if the, if the sound changes. And mine doesn't really. I mean, there's a slight pitch change, but there's no actual improper contact that's causing that. That's just a sound change. But if you have your gear, if you have your gearbox like this and you rotate it, and it sounds good, put it like this. How it's gonna how it's gonna be in the gun? Rotate it. Sound hasn't changed. If you rotate over here, sound doesn't really change, then you're good to go. But if you rotate it and it makes a knocking sound on it, on a pitch, then you have a problem. So those are issues that you need that can be fixed. All right, so I have the gearbox show back together. I have all the gears in it shimmed perfectly according to the method, and we can rotate them and just hear the nice sound that that produces. That little bit of whirring that you hear, let me do it again real quick. That whirring that you hear is usually due to there being a little bit too much space between the axle and the bushing. This isn't detrimental to your gear set. Uh, usually when it actually does, when you hear that sound, you hear it at a, a much lower speeds than what I'm rotating currently. If it occurs at a very low speed, like you just can't rotate the gears and they lock up, then you definitely have something wrong with your bushings. But since mine rotate very smoothly, it's not much of an issue. Alright, so one real quick thing we can observe is how the piston to sector gear shimming or the sector gear to piston shimming actually looks like. A lot of people don't understand this, but the piston is sort of a gear as well. It's a straight linear gear, so it's not, you know, rotational and all this stuff. So you can't really shim the piston in the gearbox show either, but you can observe the contact between the sector gear and the piston. And you can see that about 85 to 90 percent of the sector gear to piston contact is, is exists there and that's exactly what we want if it was super high or super low and we're not getting enough contact that's an issue and I may have to revisit the shimming here so if, if you follow all the rules and the instructions to my shimming guide you will end up with a gun that is flawless in shimming and sounds fantastic and the motor doesn't heat up at all you know all these great qualities and traits that you look for in a gun that has good shimming so because I, I know you guys are wondering how it sounds, got 10 to 1 gears in here with a 9-tooth DSG, M190 spring, BTC Spectra, so of course I'm going to show it off. And full auto. Alright, there you have it guys, a guide on how to flawlessly shim your airsoft gearbox. So there's one thing I did forget to mention in the video itself, is that if your bearings or bushings are rotating so much inside your gearbox shell, that's 
they're rotating with the gears or they're rubbing up against the gearbox shell, then you definitely should glue or JB weld those bushings in place so that they're not rotating inside the shell. If you allow them to rotate inside the shell, they'll actually wear down the shell, and over time it'll cause your shell to be useless. And even shells like Lone X and Retro Arms, steel is much stronger than aluminum and zinc, which is what most of our gearbox shells are made out of. So definitely JB weld or glue your bushings in if they are too loose. So before I end this video, I'm going to go over a couple of myths of shimming. So some people say, this is, this is the first myth, uh, some people say that you have to get an X amount of rotations once you're done shimming, and this simply isn't true. Some people say it's 7, some people say it's 8, some people say it's 10, I've heard some people say it's 5, I've heard some people say it's 20. It's all wrong. There's no amount of rotations your gears should get after you do a perfect uh, shimming job. There's there's no number because the rotation depends upon the gears, upon the bushings, upon the shell, upon all kinds of factors that you can't take into account when you just say that this equals that. So it's, it's, it's false, it's wrong to say that a specific number of rotations equals a perfect shim job. Alright, so myth number two is that your gun should sound a certain way when it's perfectly shimmed. This just isn't the case either. I, uh, this, the, the sound your gun produces when you shim it is, a, is dependent upon the gear meshing itself, which you can't control with shimming. So for example, a while back, Lone X A2 motors came with pinions on them that did not mesh well with SHS gears. It created a funny whirr kind of uh, rubbing sound that didn't sound good. Even though you could shim the gun perfectly with these you know, gears and this motor, it would still sound this way. So you don't get a particular sound when you shim something. Uh, so proper shimming di sounds different on a lot of guns. Uh, my P90 sounds different from my G3. My M16 sounds different from my M4 over here. It just depends on the whole setup. But what you really want to look after when you're shimming is wear on the gears. And so if you shim a gun that sounds terrible, but there's absolutely no wear on the gears and you know that they're not tight, then maybe it's just your meshing. So it's it's really silly to say that your gun must sound a certain way when you shim it. So the third and final myth of shimming is that you must use an amp meter or a voltmeter when shimming your gun. This isn't true. I've known a couple people that advocate doing this, and there's nothing wrong with advocating doing this. I just wouldn't say it's the only thing to do when testing your gun, and that if you don't do this, you're not getting a perfectly shimmed gun. I mean, maybe there's room for debate there, but I have absolutely never had to use an amperage meter when shimming any gun ever. I've done it a couple times just to see some things and to see how it works, but I've never been like, oh, I really need to use an amp meter to shim my gun. So, I call that a myth, some people wouldn't, but uh, I personally say that you do not need an amperage meter to shim a gun. Alright guys, well that is the end of this video. I am sorry it took, or it's such a long video, it's just that there are a lot of things that can arise when shimming, and so I'm going to have to explain what shimming is, define a bunch of terms, talk about the tools you need, and then go through the whole process and troubles that you could run into while shimming. It just takes a long time. And I'm sorry about that, but it just, it, it is what it is. I highly re recommend that you watch the whole video from start to finish, and then start shimming your gun, and then as you shim your gun, go start to finish again and follow all the steps. Alright, so I will see you guys in the next video of whatever the heck I do. Until then, I am the Airsoft Tech, and stay tuned, Techs.